Hello everyone, my name is Lauren and welcome to another video from the Tiny Menagerie. Whether you are brand new or not to the wonderful world of keeping fish and aquaria, there is a plethora of equipment out there to choose from which can seem really quite daunting and filters are no exception to this. There are a huge number of different styles and types, flows, inlets and outlets and designs available to you. And as you float around the internet in the unending quest to find just the right setup for your ideas, then you might just start wondering why you need a filter at all. And perhaps you can get away without having one, which is pretty much the stage that I'm at. And so this little video is going to take a sort of critical look at filters, but on a really basic level. And first off, perhaps the most obvious thing about filters is that they are a saleable product at the end of the day. And so there is always going to be a vast amount of marketing and bump around them, like there is every other gadget in the hobby, with each and every one of them claiming to be the best panaceic cure-all that's ever been around. It's going to fix every single problem you have ever had, regardless of whether that even involves fish tanks or not, all in the hopes, of course, of tempting you to part with your hard-earned cash. But any and all fanciful claims aside, Ultimately, filters have three jobs that they complete in the aquarium. Firstly, they remove stuff from the water. Any debris that's floating around in your tank, be it food or bits of leaves, anything that's small enough to get caught in the flow and get sucked into the filter inlet, where it gets trapped in the filter material, which in the vast majority of cases is going to be a sponge. In this way, larger particles are removed from the water, leaving it looking much clearer. The finer the sponge that you're pushing the water through, the finer the particles it's going to be able to collect. And so if you're trying to remove every scrap of debris from the water, you're likely to need a very fine material such as filter floss to remove all of the visible material. All of this then begs the question though, why is there so much stuff floating in the water column anyway? And in all honesty, unless you're keeping very large fish species that create a lot of water turbulence as they swim, or you have a lot of species that like to dig around in the substrate, such as Corydorus, then it is highly likely what is causing all those bits to be in the water in the first place is the filter itself. As it is the main source of movement in the tank, and the constant flow is keeping particulate matter moving in the tank, and if that sponge that you've got isn't fine enough to collect all the particles, then they're just going to circulate around and around and around, making the tank look dirty. Point in fact, take this shrimp tank. This is my experimental colony where I have mixed blue and red shrimp. The water in here isn't filtered at all. This particular tank has been set up for about two years now, although I have swapped out plants quite frequently and I like to move the wood around and try out different styles. But for the last year, it hasn't had a filter in there at all, and with nothing to disturb the water, it is perfectly clear of debris. There are lots of little dots in the water column that you can see, but that is actually Infusoria swimming freely and thriving on the remains of the oak leaves which are slowly rotting away on the substrate. The water itself is clear, the plants clean the water of any chemicals, which the shrimp produce barely any waste anyway, and so to me, there is absolutely no need to filter this water. But what if you're keeping fish? They are obviously going to produce larger waste particles and a lot more of it. However, if you actually watch one of your fish create some waste, you will notice that the majority of times it will just sink down to the substrate. There it's going to swirl about a little bit until it gets caught up in plants or decorations or on the substrate itself, especially if you have gravel. And this is regardless of whether or not the filter is on. And so it seems in my tanks, I would say only the tiniest fraction of fish waste is actually getting swept into the filter. And even if it does, it just breaks down in there rather than on the substrate, and so the end product is the same, broken down fish waste. Where this becomes a vital task is if you have a very overstocked tank, and so the volume of waste being produced is much more than the system can cope with. In this case, having a filter that can remove excess waste from the water to a place where you can quickly and conveniently clean it away, such as a nice little sponge, becomes very much more important. But, so long as your tank isn't overstocked, and you don't keep very large fish, then essentially, I am starting to question the validity of using a filter to clean the water of debris, whether that is fish waste or not. 
Second job of a filter is to produce a flow that moves the water around. They have an inlet somewhere on them and an outlet somewhere else. And so the filter will suck water in at one place, force it back out again at another, and as it does so, it creates a flow in the water around the tank. And this then means that there is a constant run of water pushing past the heater which is in the tank, and that maintains the tank at a specific temperature throughout with no hot or cold areas. And for some very sensitive species, or if you're trying to breed fish and raise the fry, then this is absolutely vital. Discus and some of these South American cichlids, for example, can be extremely sensitive to changes in temperature. And when fry are very teeny tiny, they are very sensitive to pretty much anything. The majority of small fish we keep, though, are a lot hardier than we think, especially those that can be found in natural still pools or ponds, anywhere really where there's not enough depth to create much of a turbulence. These smaller bodies of water will see slight fluctuations in temperature throughout the day, such as between the shallowest and the deepest areas, whether or not the sun is shining, when it rains and cool water falls, or when night falls. And so the fish of these waters, such as the vast majority of tetras, barbs and minnows, have a wide range of temperatures that they can be kept in. This is great for us, because it means that they are hardy and we can set our thermostats to anywhere between 22 and 28 degrees, and the fish will still thrive at those temperatures. Now, with this in mind, I decided to do a little bit of an experiment. I don't run my filters all the time, I only run them for about two hours a day. And this video is part of the explanation of why I do that, but I wanted to find out what effect this actually had on temperature. So I left the filters off for the day, as I generally do, and I measured how much the temperature changed between being next to the heater and being on the other side of the tank. And the answer is, on the heater side, the temperature of the water was around 24 degrees, whereas on the far side, it was 22 degrees. This is an absolutely negligible change to most fish, Danios could quite happily live anywhere between 15 and 27 degrees, for example. And I figure that because all of my tanks always have the heaters on, it's on all of the time because they are tropical tanks, the fish can then choose between whether they want to be on the fractionally warmer side or the slightly cooler side. And because the difference in temperature between the two sides is so small, it is of no danger to them. Now, another job of filter flow is to maintain oxygen levels in the tank. Bubbles aren't actually needed for oxygenation, and the vast majority of it takes place up at the water surface. And this happens automatically, simply because there is 21% of oxygen in the air, whereas in water it's normally around 1%. And so you'll find that oxygen is travelling from the higher concentration to the lower concentration perfectly naturally and the rest of the oxygen for the water gets topped up by plants through photosynthesis. This doesn't necessarily have to be a broadleafed plant that we can see, it can be a lot of the algae as well, they will all produce oxygen so long as they're getting light. They are producing this obviously for themselves, but the excess of it leaks into the water. Dissolved oxygen is at its highest at the very surface of the water, hence why fish will gulp up there if the oxygen levels have fallen catastrophically low and it decreases for about 10% for every metre deeper that you get in fresh water. And so, considering the fact that my tanks are only about 40 centimetres deep, even without flow, the difference in oxygen concentration between the surface and the substrate in my tank is probably about 4%. Plus, I have a lot of plants in here which will be more than enough to keep the oxygen topped up. And so essentially, I question the validity of using a filter to maintain oxygen levels through flow. And the third vital job for a filter is to be a place where there is a high degree of surface area which allows for the proliferation of bacteria. This lovely sponge has a massive surface area which will be absolutely teeming with bacteria who are the essential backbone to any tank. This microscopic life form takes highly toxic ammonia, which all fish produce from their gills, and they convert it into not quite so terrible nitrites, and from there on to slightly less terrible nitrates which are then rapidly removed by the plants in the tank. Without all of these lovely bacteria in our tanks, the tank simply wouldn't work. It would become highly toxic in a very short space of time. 
And so, providing a home for these bacteria is extremely important, and this sponge does a fantastic job because it has such a high surface area for it to grow on. Apart from... so does this moss. It has a huge surface area, and so does all of this substrate, and all of these leaves, and this wood, and all of these surfaces not only provide home for bacteria, they also provide cover and shelter and comfort for my fish and a place for my shrimp to graze. And the plants even provide lots of lovely oxygen as well. What a bonus. But what that does mean though, is that I question the validity of having a sponge purely as a home for bacteria. The rest of the tank does the job just as well. But that's not to say that I don't have filters. As I've said, I do have filters in my tanks. I have air stones in the shrimp tanks, and these days I have ASAPs on my larger tanks. And I will switch them on for a couple of hours a day, just to swish things about, break up any biofilm that's forming on the surface, as that could potentially hamper oxygen diffusion, I'm not really very sure on that one. But they are there for me, I suspect, far more than they are for the fish. But all of this is very, very much just my opinion, and maybe you're sitting there thinking, my goodness, she has gone mad, you have got to have a filter on a fish tank. And maybe I have. But my argument is that once you get to know your tank, you'll kind of know what it needs and what it doesn't. And I suppose, at the end of the day, my real advice to anyone who is new to the hobby that's now sitting there scratching their chin is go and get a filter. It doesn't matter what the style is, so long as you like it, and it will do its three allotted jobs. It makes flow, it provides a home for bacteria, and it removes stuff from the water. And once you're set up with all those bits of kit and you're confident in your new hobby, then you can start to tinker about a little bit. But for now, buy the filter. Anywho though, I hope you've enjoyed this rather odd, waffly little video, all about filters and full of advice you probably shouldn't follow. Happy fishkeeping everyone, and I will see you again soon. Bye bye!